and Public Health Committee. Great. I will read the land acknowledgement. Um, the San Francisco Health Commission acknowledges that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Owolone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Owolone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their tr traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitosho Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Is it okay if I call the items, Commissioner? Okay. Please. Uh, item two is approval of the minutes of the August 17, 2021 meeting. Um, should we call the roll first? Of course. Thank you. I Thank apologize. You. Uh, Commissioner Drada. Here. Commissioner Christian. Here. And Commissioner Chung. Here. And I also note that Commissioner Bernal is here um, uh, as not a, as a guest. Guest appearance. Guest appearance. <laughs> and thank you. And I apologize, Commissioner, for not doing the roll call. So now we can move to item two, which is the August 17, 2021 minutes. Yes. I think everybody probably just received them. Are there any um, additions, deletions, corrections to the minutes of August? I don't have any. I have a motion, please. I move to approve the minutes from August. And I second. November, from, from November. Wait, August 17th. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and I second which, whichever one. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not, there's no public comment. Um, and before I do a roll call vote, Commissioner Drotter, just for you to know, you, uh, because you didn't receive your paper packet, you're the only one who didn't get the minutes. Everybody else got them in their packet. No, okay. So I got apologies for that. Um, so I'll start with you, Commissioner Drotter. Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Chong? Yes. And I'll, I'll ask you as well, Commissioner Bernal, since you're here in the room. Yes. Okay, great. The item passes. We can move on to item three. Um, the, Dr. Buckminder's presentation, Bridge HIV, Research Overview, Innovations in HIV Prevention. Can we just for one, I'd like to stop for just one minute, excuse me, for just one minute. I'd like to follow up on a item that was on the minutes, uh, which was uh, the item concerning the internship program and that within the next six months that it uh, central internship focus or role would be um, operative and hopefully on our website. So I, if uh, what the other commissioners would like, I'd like to see then the six months would be our February meeting to have a follow-up report. Set on the calendar and update you. Um, I'll, I'll contact the presenters and make sure they're available and get back to you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. And now we can go on to you, uh, Dr. Buckbinder. Okay. Um, hopefully my slides are showing now. They look good. Great. So um, thanks so much for the invitation to come and speak. I'm really delighted to tell you about some of the work that we're doing in Bridge HIV, which is a research unit based in Population Health Division. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, up front my colleagues, Dr. Al Lu and Dr. Hyman Scott, um, with whom I work very closely on all of these projects. So who are we? We're an NIH funded clinical trials unit that operates within the population health division of the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and we're affiliated with UCSF. Um, our mission is to collaborate with communities in conducting innovative research that will guide HIV prevention locally and globally. We have a long history. Um, we actually started in uh, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I believe it was 1982. There were specimens and data stored from a study of um, hepatitis B from City Clinic, our municipal STD clinic, um, that had taken place in 1978 to 1980. There were 6,700, um, actually 6,704. Um, gay and bisexual men who had uh, participated in some hepatitis B studies. And um, by 1981, it was recognized that 
40% of the AIDS of the people who uh, had developed AIDS in the city had actually participated in this study. And so we went back to the stored specimens, went back to the data, CDC funded this study. Um, we went back and contacted people who had been in the original study to try to learn more about the um, whether uh, wh what was going on with AIDS at the time. Um, it was used in part to develop the HIV antibody test. We studied the natural history of HIV infection, and we specifically looked then at long-term non-progressors, people who had been infected for a long period of time, over 10 years, um, we were able to tell from their, um, from their old specimens, but who were staying healthy despite not uh, being on any antiretrovirals. So um, we grew from that study to studies of vaccine preparedness, where we were recruiting and retaining people who were HIV uninfected, but at risk of HIV infection, looking at issues of risk factors for infection and what the per contact risk was of a variety of different sexual activities. We moved on to behavioral and biomedical interventions because we were just seeing people get infected and we felt we needed to do something to intervene. And we studied a number of different inter interventions. I'm just highlighting the ones that we're still working on now, preventive vaccines, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is using antiretroviral anti-HIV medication um, on a daily basis or on a um, uh, uh, period of time around the time of sex to prevent HIV infection, topical agents like rectal and vaginal microbicides and vaginal rings, peer navigation among Black and Latino um, men, men sex with men, and home HIV and STI testing. And then we've moved from that into looking at a variety of different kinds of combination interventions doing implementation research to take what we've learned and try to apply it in real world settings and fostering a new generation of HIV researchers. Oh, and we joined then the COVID-19 prevention network. So we're actually currently part of four networks. Three of them are HIV based. One is the HIV vaccine trials network where we study HIV vaccines and broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's the HIV prevention trials network where we're studying new PrEP agents, uh, long acting PrEP formulations and integrated strategies. And then there's the um, adolescent trials network where we're looking at PrEP support tools. And this is for youth uh, who are at risk for HIV infection. And then um, beginning last year, we started, we became part of the COVID-19 prevention network or the COVPN was formed by NIH and it's a global network of NIH sites and clinical research organization sites um, that link together multiple NIH sponsored networks, predominantly the HIV prevention network and treatment networks. We had a site here at San Francisco Department of Public Health and Bridge HIV. There's a site at UCSF, um, a site at EBAC um, in Oakland and a site at the San Francisco VA hospital. The, the mission was to conduct phase three efficacy trials to prevent HIV, uh, to prevent COVID infection and COVID disease. And we enrolled 256 participants into the AstraZeneca trial. And I apologize, this, the slides I sent to you had a, a typo in them. 20%, 32% were Latinx, 20% uh, Black or African American, 20% Asian, 19% white, 16%, 6% multiracial, 2% Native uh, Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 1% um, American Indian or Alaska Native, um, and 30% were over the age of 60. So we were very pleased that we had a very diverse population, including a very vulnerable population of those people over the age of 60 that we enrolled in our trial. And that trial is ongoing. So everything we do, you can see our, our tagline is where science meets community is really about community engagement. It's very important to all of the work that we do. And these are just some of the posters of some of the kinds of um, uh, community forums that we've put on uh, to talk about different components of HIV or SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 uh, prevention, including we had a trans-COVID um, uh, forum last year. We also had one on safer sex and COVID. So what do we know about PrEP? Well, it's, it's believed to be over 99% effective when used uh, on a daily basis and perhaps equally effective when used uh, 
in a two one one regimen around the time of sex for men who have sex with men. Um, what are we doing with it in in San Francisco? Well, you can see it at City Clinic, a very large proportion each year, a larger proportion of their uh, patient population is on PrEP, which is great, except that we have these racial and ethnic disparities where black African Americans have a lower rate of uptake. But these are really phenomenal levels of uptake um, compared with what's going on in other cities. This is not citywide because si San Francisco City Clinic actually offers PrEP. So some of this is because they're seeing their own patients, but it's great that people who are utilizing sexual health services have such high rates of PrEP uptake in the city. But what we know is that lack of PrEP persistence accentuates PrEP disparities, and we have high discontinuation rates. The average duration, this comes from our San Francisco primary care clinics, our um, PrEP discontinuation rates are uh, high and that the average duration is only eight, a little over eight months that people are on PrEP. Now, you don't need to be on PrEP for life. You only need to be on it for periods when you're at risk. But we have had seroconversions in people who have come off of um, PrEP. So we've had people become HIV infected when they stopped their PrEP. Um, and at 12 months, the retention rate was only 38%. And we have these racial and ethnic disparities where you can see that the group that comes off most quickly were um, black African Americans. Next were the Latinx population. Um, we also know that youth, people who inject drugs, and trans women are also less likely to stay on PrEP. And there are a variety of reasons why people stop PrEP. Sometimes what we did is we actually did a study in which we interviewed a number of people who had stopped PrEP and particularly interviewed all of the people who had become HIV infected after stopping PrEP. Some of the reasons were um, lack of housing, um, substance use, or um, uh, uh, mental health issues. Side effects were one of the things that some people reported. Difficulty keeping clinic appointments was another thing that people reported. And some people just didn't want to take a daily pill. And so we're trying to address each of those kinds of barriers through a variety of different support mechanisms that I'm going to be describing uh, shortly. So this is one of the kinds of strategies to help people um, increase both HIV testing and PrEP. This is the link study that we've been doing through the Adolescent Trials Network. It has a, a sexual health promotion score that helps you to see, are you at risk? Would you benefit from PrEP? If um, if uh, your score is low enough, it indicates that you're in the red zone and you're at high risk of uh, HIV infection. And so you might benefit from PrEP and we help link people to PrEP services. Um, it also, we give them feedback on their sexual practices um, so that they can, they can track who, with whom they're having sex and what kind of sex they're having. Um, and then this is for HIV testing. And then we also give out awards for safer sex um, uh, practices. PrepMate is another um, uh, tool that's being used. It's a two-way texting support tool that was developed originally um, for treatment in Kenya and was found to be effective in that setting. And so we applied it to PrEP, um, particularly PrEP persistence in young, um, diverse men who have sex with men. So we did a study in which we were able to double the rate of PrEP persistence uh, in young, um, pre predominantly African American men who have sex with men, um, and all it is is it's just a regular check-in. That's they get a text that says how are things going, and they respond either okay or not great. And it's a way of triaging those people who need help. So then we do outreach to the people who have some, one problem or another, so that we can keep them on PrEP um, so that if they run into problems with side effects or problems with making their appointments, um, we can help to facilitate um, whatever it is that they need. It was the first CDC adopted evidence-based intervention for PrEP. It hasn't yet been widely used because it required, but I, I don't know if other people have adopted it. We are trying to actually get it disseminated. And one of the studies I'll tell you about is actually doing a head-to-head -head comparison of PrepMate with another one of our um, apps, which is Dot Diary. This is um, rather than having us do outreach to people, this is testing whether or not some self-contained app that gives you 
information about what level of protection you're at and whether you need to take prep um, how much you need to take it in order to get back to a high level of protection. Um, and we found that this is also motivating for people. They say, I never want to see the red. I want to stay in the green. And so it helps people to stay on prep. So we're doing a head to head comparison of those 2 uh, apps to see in real world clinic settings in um, San Francisco, Miami and Washington DC to see if um, it might uh, which 1 if or both um, may uh, be helpful in keeping people on prep. We also know about two one, what we call 2-1-1 prep, which is taking two pills 2 to 24 hours before sex, one pill um, 24 hours later, and another pill 24 hours after that. It's been shown to be very highly effective um, in a number of different settings, particularly in Europe. We um, know that it can be quite uh, effective and be helpful for people who don't want to take a daily pill, but it's also quite complex trying to figure out what, how much do you need to wait before you, because you need to, your first pill has to be at least two hours before you have sex. So we give people information about when they're, how much time they have until they're protected. We also tell them, remind them about um, needing to take the pills after sex. Um, and and give them a, again feedback about sexual practices. And so um, this is another uh, approach that we're using to try to help support prep use, particularly for people who are using two on one prep. And then um, some people didn't want to have to make doctor's appointments. And so one of the th the other projects that we've developed is a research study called Prep 3D. It stands for Digital Diary and Delivery. And it's for men who have sex with men, um, and we're going to be including transgender uh, individuals in our next um, iteration of it, which starts in January, uh, in which we have online pharmacists who provide prep treatment um, themselves through a collaborative practice agreement, so that they people don't need to actually see a provider. The pharmacist does the prescription. They consult with us if there are any questions. Um, we do medication delivery through a courier, and they have a number of different online tools to help support their prep use. And then this is just a listing of some of the studies that we currently have underway or uh, that are on the horizon. So Merck is studying a, a monthly pill called Islatravir, which is a novel um, antiretroviral pill that can be taken just once a month for prevention. So we're studying that right now in men who have sex with men and transgender women. We have the Gilead study, um, which is studying a, no a novel anti-HIV medication called lenacapavir, which just needs to be injected um, every six months for PrEP. So that could, again, get away for people who don't wanna be taking a daily pill, it could be quite helpful. Um, GlaxoSmithKline, we have two studies uh, potentially with them. One is we're studying genital herpes outbreaks in individuals um, with herpes. And then we may be studying um, the meningococcal vaccine to see if we can prevent gonorrhea infections. AMBER is a socio-behavioral research to help with implant development for PrEP because some agents are going to be able to be implanted as PrEP and we need to know who wants to use it? And so we are going to be studying this, particularly in men who have sex with men, cisgender women, and transgender women. Um, we have uh, studies of PrEP and antiretroviral treatment implementation. The PCORI um, is that comparative effectiveness trial that I told you about that's studying PrEP um, dot diary against um, PrEP mate. Uh, Vive is funding a study um, for us to use their novel um, injectable long-acting antiretroviral treatment specifically for transgender women. And we have, um, we just got funding uh, for the HOPE project, which will be working with CalPEP in the East Bay. It's a mobile clinic delivery of HIV status neutral services. So that means we do HIV testing and then we give services both to people living with HIV as well as people who may be at risk for HIV, and that's specifically for the African American community. And then we have a number of HIV vaccine studies. Um, uh, the Mosaico trial is a large efficacy study that's taking place in 51 sites in um, eight countries that I'm leading 
um, for the H HIV vaccine trials network, and that's fully enrolled now. It, we have 3,903 participants enrolled in the study overall. Um, we enrolled 30 here in San Francisco, which was the highest enrolling US site. And then we have four phase one or phase two studies of new vaccines or monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. And this is a pre pandemic picture. So a number of the people have actually changed, but um, we don't have a picture now because we are always wearing our masks. So I wanted to show you what um, a, a, an iteration of Bridge HIV looked like. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Hey, commissioners, there is no, uh, there's no one on the public comment line, so there's no public comment. Any questions? Oh, uh, Commissioner Dorado. Thank you so much for this excellent report. When I, I read it, I was just really in awe of the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. My question is um, with both PrepMate and dot diary do you have any um data on the number of users for either either app yeah so right now we're just enrolled so only um neither of them is really being used publicly yet so we're really okay. just testing them in our studies themselves and we'll be enrolling about 300 people into the studies across the three sites in san francisco uh Washington DC and Miami. Um, the, we're, what we're trying to do is to get either one or both of them to be able to be available uh, to the public more broadly um, by doing this study and doing this testing in real world settings. Okay. Within that, will you be um, collecting data by age groups? Yes, we will. Um, and I, believe that this study only goes down to age 18. So we were not able to include adolescents just because of the challenges with parental consent and such. Right. Um, but we will be looking specifically across different age categories. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Bernal. Yes. Hi, Dr. Bookbinder. Hi. Um, Thanks to you and Dr. Liu and Dr. Scott um, and your whole team. Y'all are some of my heroes. So very uh, grateful to get this uh, really great presentation about some of the fantastic work that's being done, um, particularly during a time where everybody was pulled in so many directions uh, with response to COVID. And I know that your team played a key role in that as well. Um, I know that when looking um, at uh, particularly HIV care during the pandemic, we found that, um, you know, while uh, Black African American men tended to have lower uh, levels of viral suppression than other racial groups, that during the pandemic, every other racial group sort of fell down to the level that Black African American men were at, who sort of remained unchanged. Are there any lessons that you have been able to learn from uh the pandemic and how we conduct prevention that might help either reduce disparities or look at new ways of approaching prevention in our community yeah so that's a great question um one of the things that we felt was really critical because we watched this this cliff that people fell off of for both prevention and treatment um when mm. COVID hit was to get the city to declare both HIV treatment and prevention as, as essential services. So when things were shut down to be essential services only, we realized that we needed to very, very make explicit for community-based organizations and clinics that were providing services that HIV prevention and HIV care are essential services, um, including HIV testing and PrEP. Um, I think that we are learning that we can diversify the way in which we deliver care um, through telehealth, um, video conferencing, phone calls, um, but that that only works for some people and that that can um, exacerbate uh, things if you have a big digital divide. And so I think mm -hmm. having a variety of different strategies to try to address people's needs, because some people didn't wanna come into clinics 
um, mm. during that time. And so we're not getting care. That's why we also have this prep 3D project where we're looking at using a pharmacy based um, strategy where the pharmacy itself can do the prep prescribing. Um, mm. We hope that that will be a successful um, approach to delivering prep. So I think just trying out a number of different diverse strategies, the pop up clinic at Ward 86 was able to actually increase viral suppression over time during the period of COVID um, because they specifically went opened up again um, or they stayed open throughout, but then they went and did more outreach um, during that period of time as well. And they're a drop in clinic. And so they're really trying to serve a very um, marginalized group of people who are unstably housed and not virally suppressed or not on treatment. So I think we, we are trying to learn lessons from the COVID pandemic. And I think one of the things that we've learned is sometimes people say, well, it can't be done that way. And we, with COVID, we learned sometimes we can, yes, of course we can do it that way. And, and telehealth is one of those things. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Chung, and then Commissioner Christian. Hi, um, thank you again, Dr. Buckbinder, for um, like the wealth of information that you share with us. You know, I just have one clarifying question for you. You mentioned about the PrEP 3D um, that is currently, you know, targeting men who have sex with men, and you're going to open that up to transgender people. Do you mean specifically transgender men who have sex with men, or do you mean transgender men and women? Transgender men and women um, who have sex with men. So people who are potentially at risk for HIV infection who may be on PrEP. Okay, thank you. Sure. And Commissioner Christian. Yes, it's um, amazing and stunning the breadth uh, and depth of your work and how smart it is. and how um, current. So it's just really always uh, a pleasure to hear about, uh, at least the spirits, to hear the work that you're doing. And I kind of have a follow-up question to what um, President Bernal was asking and what you were dis discussing with him about lessons learned, the way that um, demographically everybody uh, fell off a cliff and came down to a level uh, that of uh, treatment access or uh, accessing treatment that Black and African American people in the city were already at, but but that didn't that uh, population didn't go any further down than they were. Do you? It sounds like you were either uh, you're talking to definitely your clients, you know, throughout that period and now about what was going on with them and why they did or did not continue to engage and what were the barriers to it. I wonder, um, I, are you doing actual kind of surveys or interviews? I, I'm curious to, to know what people say about the effect that the pandemic, that at the beginning of the pandemic had on them, in addition to making it um, difficult to access services they might have wanted to access. Did they begin to think that it was hopeless or was there something emotionally uh, and psychologically happening with them that led that might have also contributed to um, them not pushing to maintain access. What a great question. Um, well, unfortunately, we're not doing any surveys and, and what you're suggesting actually is that we should be doing some surveys specifically to try to get at that question. Um, we are mostly working in the in the environs of uh, HIV prevention, but we are doing some treatment related studies. And I think that there could be some ways in which we could integrate surveys into those studies to try to understand what people's experience was. I know that there are some published data um, from people in particular around the issue of PrEP um, asking, did your sexual, did you go, did you stay on PrEP? Did you go off PrEP? What we know is that a lot of people, um, change, a lot of people stopped their PrEP. A lot of people then also changed from taking daily prep to just taking it around the time of sex because they were um, having less sex. But some people were having more sex during that period of time. And so what we don't really 
understand fully is, were they getting the services that they needed to cover what their needs were? And the same would be true for people living with HIV. Are the services, did they feel that they had access to the services that they needed uh, during that time? Did their perception of need change or did their perception of access to, to services change or did their, you know, probably did their access to services themselves really change over time? And if they were using services in a different way, um, how and why? But we, we have not done that study yet, but it's an excellent suggestion. Well, I, uh, if you get to do that study, certainly look forward to hearing what you learn and what you think you're learning. And the final question I had, you were talking, you were, get, you gave a presentation about a number of different interventions, uh, possible interventions that are being studied and developed aimed at different populations. And one was an injectable, um, an injection that was aimed at transgender women. Can you just talk about why uh, transgender women would be, uh, you feel they're more likely to want that type of uh, treatment as opposed to any other uh, person? Yeah, so um, it's just a, a population that has been underserved um, by uh, our medical community in general, and specifically also around uh, HIV. And because this is a large injection in the, um, uh, in the buttocks, Sometimes women have either implants or have had uh, injections of silicone um, that may make it difficult for them to actually receive PrEP. And so we felt it was really important to understand what, because this is a huge breakthrough in treatment to only require once a month injection as opposed to requiring a daily pill, we felt that there really was very little work that had been done yet in transgender women about their desire for this kind of treatment their specific needs around the treatment, um, how to handle issues around um, injectables when um, they may have been excluded from previous trials because of um, their situations. And so we felt that it was a, just an important population to, to focus on because they had been underserved in the, in the trials themselves, in the previous That's trials that had tested them. That's very interesting and it makes a lot of sense. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, and the final thing I just want to say is that it's uh, really exciting to see the work that you're doing with the apps, because I think um, I would imagine that a lot of us have found in the last year uh, that I certainly use apps more than I ever thought I would and find some of them extraordinarily useful and um, even motivating. So uh, I, I'm hoping that that will be a really fruitful, continue to be a really fruitful um, exploration for you. Yeah, we we certainly hope so as well. That's why we're uh, we're trying. We've been basically trying to survey the populations that we serve and ask them what is it that they want and what is it that they need, and then try to build those into our our program. So uh, apps are one of them. Great. Well, you are our heroes. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Well, you all are heroes of mine for being our health commissioners. So thank you for the the work that you do for the city. Thank you, Dr. Buckbunder. Thank you. I think it's time to move on to the next item. Um, Dr. Almeida, would you like me to share screen for your slides or will you be doing it? I, I have forgotten, I apologize. I'm happy to share. Okay, great, give me a second to give that permission to you. Thank you. It should show up any minute. Actually, uh, I should uh, be sharing now. I can announce for the public who's watching the video. Uh, item four is the housing conservative update. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for having me here today. Always a pleasure to come talk and give updates about our programs. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about housing conservatorship, which we have to submit an annual report for uh, with the state and also locally with the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor's Office. Those reports are due in the beginning of the year, so this will be a preview of what will be included in that report. So just to give a reminder um, about housing conservatorship, uh, this is a program that's designed to support individuals who are cycling in and out of crisis and are incapable of caring for their health and well-being. Um, particularly, these are individuals who can't be served by other compulsory treatment, including assisted outpatient treatment or our traditional LPS conservatorship, and have had multiple opportunities to engage in voluntary services, um, but have declined those services. 
there's fairly strict and lengthy criteria. Um, so these are just some to name. Um, but I'll just say this program is designed for individuals who have both a serious mental illness and struggle with substance use. I'm sure uh, many, if not all of you are aware that LPS conservatorship accounts for chronic alcoholism, but does not account for other psychoactive substances. So this is unique to the housing conservatorship program. Um, in addition to that, one of the major criteria is that an indi individual has to have eight or more 5150s um, in a 12 month period or involuntary holds in a 12 month period. Um, and just to note that that 12 months is determined for each individual. It's not based off of a calendar or fiscal year, as long as there were eight that occurred in those 12 months. And again, as is true of any compulsory care, there is always a requirement that we show that an individual has been offered voluntary services. Housing conservatorship takes it a step forward um, in which documentation needs to show that voluntary services were offered at each um, uh, involuntary psychiatric hold or 5150 um, and that is part of the packet that gets included uh, to the court when we submit a petition. So this is newer legislation um, and we are a pilot location for implementing this. It was originally signed as Senate Bill 1045 in 2018 um, and then in 2019 was adopted locally by the Board of Supervisors. There were some pretty significant changes between Senate Bill 1045 and Senate Bill 40 that was passed in October of 2019. Um, and subsequently, that has been the bill that we've been working to implement. We have done a lot to collaborate with our partners, um, including local hospitals, because as we know, individuals can be seen as at multiple hospitals. So it requires um, a lot of effort to gather records and information from our different hospitals. Of course, the Department of Public Health uh, works very closely with the Department of Disability and Aging Services, community partners, providers, et cetera, uh, to both train um, and gather information about individuals who are possibly on the pathway to a housing conservatorship. We've also worked very closely uh, with hospitals and in particular, um, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital Psychiatric Emergency Services to actively engage and outreach individuals who are on that pathway. Um, of course, we always want conservatorship to be a last resort for individuals, um, and so want to ensure that we're proactively supporting individuals, offering different levels of care, and doing our best to build those relationships and engage individuals. One of the requirements that was newer in Senate Bill 40, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this as I share some data, um, but one of the newer requirements is that starting at the fifth 5150 or fifth involuntary psychiatric hold, we need to start noticing somebody that they're on the pathway to a housing conservatorship. So while an individual needs to have eight 5150s in a 12 month period uh, for a petition for conservatorship to be filed, starting at the fifth 5150 and all the 5150s thereafter, they receive official notice that they're on the pathway how many 5150s are left uh, before a petition could be filed, and what are the options and voluntary services that we're offering them. Um, and just to say all of this and, and gathering this information um, and the requirements that are necessary in implementing a new law, the forms were finalized with the court in 2020, which allowed us to really start moving forward with contemplating individuals moving forward with some petitions. Um, and I think last time when I had um, come to speak to you, we had not yet filed any petitions for conservatorship. So I have some new updates on that today. So it's in 20, uh, fiscal year 2021, we have placed two individuals on a housing conservatorship. In total, three petitions have been filed. One case was not awarded, uh, but two people are currently placed on a housing conservatorship. The other piece that is important to note is that while um, individuals do not need to be experiencing homelessness to be contemplated for this conservatorship. What we know about the population is that many individuals who are cycling in and out of crisis are also experiencing homelessness. Once a conservatorship has ended, an individual is guaranteed a placement and permanent supportive housing. So while we have not reached that point yet, we are also working very closely with the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing to ensure that individuals are transitioning into permanent housing once they are no longer on a conservatorship. 
But of course, in looking at this data, um, while very few individuals have been placed on a conservatorship, it also gives us an opportunity to look at the larger population of individuals who have frequent um, involuntary psychiatric holds and what are the characteristics of the population, what are our opportunities to serve those individuals, and in many situations to better serve those individuals. Um, as I, I noted before, we look at a lot of data for individuals with four or more involuntary holds, because for us, that's really the trigger where we start contemplating that pathway towards conservatorship um, and really um, actively working with individuals or, or trying to actively work with individuals um, to support them to engage in voluntary services um, instead of going towards conservatorship. So during fiscal year 2021, there were 92 individuals seen at psychiatric emergency services who had four or more involuntary psychiatric holds or 5150s. Of those individuals, 14 individuals had eight or more 5150s. So met at least the criteria of having eight or more 5150s to be considered for this program. So we spent some time looking at the details of those individuals' cases. Um, three of those individuals remained unsheltered at the end of the fiscal year. Um, those individuals have been offered uh, shelter opportunities and treatment programs. Um, have not accepted those programs and remain unsheltered, although we continue to try to support, um, including through our less restrictive care in assisted outpatient treatment and other voluntary services like intensive case management. We have successfully been able to support or link 11 individuals to behavioral health services, including intensive case management, outpatient behavioral health care, or residential treatment. Of course, these individuals, we continue to monitor their engagement in services um, and if necessary, we'll pursue conservatorship down the road if we're unsuccessful in supporting and stabilizing them in voluntary care. We always contemplate other opportunities to support them. Um, and as I previously stated, one of the criteria for housing conservatorship is that they do not qualify, an individual does not qualify for other services, including um, LPS conservatorship or assisted outpatient treatment. Currently, four of the 14 individuals have been placed on an LPS conservatorship during that time. And I think most importantly, as I, I stated, most of these individuals um, have experienced uh, homelessness or housing instability. 13 of the 14 individuals have been assessed by coordinated entry. Um, this is the assessment that the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing uses uh, to determine um, an individual's ability to be placed into permanent supportive housing. And so we've been able to support 13 individuals to complete that assessment. And of course, then the work is to support them and partner with HSH to move them towards housing to help stabilize them. Going back a little bit and zooming out um, for the 92 individuals who had four or, four or more um, involuntary psychiatric holds, and to again share some of those demographic information, 50% of those individuals have are currently experiencing homelessness or housing instability. 52% have um, medical um, or urgent emergent service use. 64% have contact with the jail. Um, but we know have relatively low numbers of contact with ongoing services. 11% are currently on a conservatorship. 41% are linked to intensive case management or outpatient behavioral health services. And only 57% have been assessed for coordinated entry or on that pathway towards housing. Um, so we know, unfortunately, that individuals have high rates of contact with the criminal justice system um, with urgent, emergent medical and, and psychiatric care, but we struggle with supporting and ongoing services. And this is certainly an opportunity um, and certainly part of the work, of course, of Mental Health SF and our other programs to address the needs of similar populations. So transitioning slightly into our uh, annual reports that we submit. Um, our report to the state very much focuses on only individuals who have been placed on a conservatorship. And again, for us right now, that's two individuals. The local report pro provides some more population level context, which we always think is important to share and I think will be of interest um, to the commission today. 
The first three requirements uh, uh, through the health code that we submit to the Board of Supervisors and the mayor's office, again, very much focuses on individuals who've been placed on the conservatorship, um, the treatment plan for those individuals, long term and short term outcomes for individuals and any impact um, on existing services. Um, and of course, part of the requirement of implementing such a program is that it does not take away or impact our other voluntary care. The piece that the, the um, working group has really focused on around housing conservatorship are items four and five that looks at the population level of who's being placed on an involuntary or 5150 hold in San Francisco and situations where 5150 is initiated by a peace officer um, and why that's the case and where are other opportunities to intervene and support individuals. And so I'll, I'll spend some time talking about that today. This year we were fortunate and over the last couple of years, this data has changed quite significantly. Um, it has taken us some time to be able to gather information from our local hospitals. And so this year we have the most robust level of information of the volume of 5150 seen across San Francisco. Of course, we have the most detailed information for individuals who are seen um, through psychiatric emergency services. So not only have a total count of 5150 seen at psychiatric emergency services, but we also know how many unique individuals um, that is for and how many 5150s each individual has. Um, at this time, we are not able to get that information from other local hospitals, although that's something that we are certainly working towards. Um, so what you see here is a total unduplicated count of involuntary holds across San Francisco. Again, this is uh, certainly duplicative for individuals, uh, but a total count of 5150s in the city in fiscal year 2021 was roughly 13,000 individuals. And just to highlight again, this includes information from Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, as well as CPMC, St. Francis, St. Mary's, um, UCSF, and Kaiser. The other piece um, that the, the Housing Conservatorship Working Group has really focused on over the last couple of years is uh, wanting to ensure that this program and compulsory care is not disproportionately affecting communities of color in San Francisco. And so we have been tracking uh, trends over the last couple of years to look at this. And so what you see here is data of individuals who have four or more 5150s and looking at this from when the program started uh, so starting in fiscal year 1819 through fiscal year 2021. Um, and you see there have been some fluctuations in the demographics and ethnicity of who's been seen. And just to highlight, I know Commissioner Gerardo, there was a question of the age of individuals. So I'll just share while we're paused here for four or more 5150s. The age range um, was from 20 to 76, um, so quite a broad um, range of ages uh, for individuals with multiple involuntary holds. For individuals who have eight or more um, involuntary holds or 5150s, that's a much smaller um, age range and with most individuals around uh, 30 years old. So moving along um, to, sh to share this story, the other piece that we look at is not just how the data changes from year to year for individuals who are seen, who have four or more um, 5150 or involuntary psychiatric holds, but also looking at how this compares overall to individuals who are seen at psychiatric emergency services um, and how this compares to the San Francisco census estimate. Um, and so here you see that comparison um, and just to highlight, of course, that uh, for Black and African American individuals, not only are they a higher percentage of individuals who are seen at psychiatric emergency services, particularly when compared to the general population, but even an even higher percentage of individuals who have four or more involuntary psychiatric holds. So we'll just pause for a second. And this next slide is just a summary of the last two slides. We know it's a little busy, so we wanted to make sure that we shared the journey of how we got here, um, but this has the complete information here to show the landscape of uh, demographic, particularly race and ethnicity data 
for individuals who have four or more involuntary psychiatric holds, how that compares to overall who's seen at psychiatric emergency services and in the general population. The last requirement I'll speak to today is uh, requirement number five, which as I noted is, is specifically looking at 5150s that were performed by a peace officer or law enforcement and why that was the most appropriate person to perform the detention. Um, so we work very closely with the San Francisco uh, Police Department and they provide us with information. So this includes 5150s that they initiated for fiscal year 2021. Uh, which was roughly 2,650s during that time. And they were able to provide us with information and appreciate them taking the time to delve into this, a lot of which they needed to pull from narratives from reports, um, including the date and time of the 5150 hold, the reason for the emergency call, so what was the catalyst for police being called out to begin with, and then what was the uh, hold for? Was it for danger to self, danger to others, or grave disability? And so this first slide here shows us what the 911 co co uh, call was coded as. And so as you can see, in most of these situations, they were 801 calls or suicide attempts. Just to highlight that most suicide attempts calls are understandably coded as priority A um, and currently receive a police response. Um, our next highest ones were for mental health, deten or mental health detentions or where a 5150 was already initiated. Um, and police officers were called to the scene. And then thirdly, I'll, I'll pause are these 800 calls for the me mentally disturbed persons. And you see that this has been pretty consistent from fiscal year 1920 to 2021. And the reason I wanna pause here is I know we've also had the opportunity to talk about the street crisis response team, which implemented just about a year ago. Uh, we're just about to celebrate our one year anniversary on the 30th. And the street crisis response team is explicitly responding to these mentally disturbed person calls um, instead of law enforcement. And so we imagine that over the next year, next couple of years, we'll see a shift here. And just want to highlight because it's a relatively high volume of the calls um, that there. This is one of the interventions and shifts that we'll see in our system. We also see well-being checks, uh, which are 910 calls. Um, which could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, well-being checks can run the gamut of, I haven't heard from my grandmother in a couple of days and I'm really worried about her, to somebody is in my doorway experiencing homelessness and I'm concerned. Um, the last uh, three categories are situations um, including assault battery, fighting, uh, where there's no weapon or a person with a knife. So presumably uh, much more serious situations that ultimately resulted in a 5150 or an involuntary hold from the community. And the last piece I'll share are the reasons um, why law enforcement are initiating 5150s based off of their assessment of the individuals. And we again see this being fairly consistent from fiscal year 1920 to 2021 um, with the primary reason being danger to self then danger to others, um, and then finally grave disability. Um, as you can see, there is a fairly significant uptick for grave disability with 8% uh, or uh, sorry, decline uh, from 12% in 1920 to 8% uh, in fiscal year 2021. We of course know that the assessment for grave disability is fairly nuanced. Um, and that's something that we certainly the street crisis response team supports um, in assessing individuals um, and it also being able to include collateral information from electronic health records to support that initiating a 5150. So let me plus here, I know that that's a lot of information to share and a lot to unpackage um, and just see if there's any additional questions. And Commissioner Gerardo, I again appreciate you letting me know what questions you had in advance and hopefully I answered them all, but please let me know if I missed any. Commissioners, there is one person on the, uh, the line, so I will ask if there's any public comment. Person uh, on the line, if you'd like to make comment on item four, please press star three to raise your hand. Item four, housing conservative conservatorship update. I do not see any hand. So commissioners, any questions or comments from you? Okay, uh, Commissioner Gerardo. 
I just want to thank you for answering my questions. Um, I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to clarify one statistic. You said that the average age of eight or more 5150s was 30 years old? Uh, was in the, uh, 30, uh, 30 to 40, I should clarify. 30 but they, to 40. they clustered around that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's That was uh, my question. And uh, my other is, who um, are the, uh, other than police officers, able to do a 5150 in the city and county? I appreciate that. So um, law enforcement is provided authority to initiate 5150s in California through the Welfare and Institutions Act. Other than that, the authority is granted by the behavioral health director. Um, and so we have a robust training plan um, through behavioral health services uh, where individuals are provided with authority to initiate 5150s, which uh, of course in behavioral health largely includes um, psychiatrists, uh, behavioral health clinicians, um, and that's across our system in both DPH clinics and community-based organizations. And we partner very closely with them around that. Um, more recently, the Board of Supervisors passed legislation that would allow uh, the fire department, specifically EMS, uh, to be able to initiate 5150s. That has not yet been implemented. That's something that we're working with uh, the fire department closely on to develop a plan that will still be under the purview of the of Dr. Cunnins as the behavioral health director. And so they will similarly go through a, a training process um, and will be granted authority through the behavioral health director. So just to follow up, the um, any individual psychiatrist, et cetera, or um, other MD uh, needs to go through this training program in order to 50, be able to 5150 someone within the city and county. Am I correct? Correct. Outside of law enforcement. Yes, that's what I mean. Outside of law enforcement. Okay. That's that's what I thought. I ran into this issue a couple of times in uh, other hospitals, emergency rooms with upset emergency room physicians and had to try to explain it. So I wanted to clarify it and I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Commissioner Christian. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's good to see you, Dr. Almeida. Thank you for this great presentation. And I'd like to follow up a little bit on the last question that Commissioner Gerardo uh, had uh, in your answer. Commissioner, you said that you ran into some upset uh, people in a, a hospital. Were they were they physicians or were, were they um, law enforcement or they were they upset that um, what was the problem? Uh, this, if, if you're, is what the it was a. Uh, a physician in an emergency room, and this was with an adolescent. Um, and one in the was the physician, emergency room physician, determined that this adolescent needed to be 5150 because he was a danger to self, had a significant suicidal plan, had already been um, there was an attempt, and uh, before he could 5150 um the he could not do that and had to call law enforcement um to the emergency room to be able to 5150 the adolescent that was the a couple of situations that i happened to be involved in that is and, uh th thanks for those details go ahead doctor Didn't oh uh, i apologize commissioner i was just going to say that's helpful context and just to clarify of course that 5150 holds are specifically for individuals over the age of 18 under the age of, of 18 it's a different code it's 5585 part of the welfare and institutions code uh, law enforcement are able to initiate those and in san francisco our designated organization to initiate those are our comprehensive crisis services, which of course includes expertise in child crisis. And so right. there are specific, specific situations where that's a barrier. I know our comprehensive crisis services would be happy to support that and happy to make that connection as well. Thank you, yes, they were called, but oftentimes it takes a few hours for them to, this always generally happens about midnight or 1 a.m. So it's, uh, and uh, the criteria needs to be uh, met. So I appreciate that. Yes. Um, 
but I guess the adolescent I was dealing with was uh, was 18. So I didn't feel he was quite <clears throat> still adolescent mind, not age. Got but it. thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Clarification. And from, I guess, to both of you, from your professional perspectives, would it be useful to have more to have more psychiatrists and I don't even know if psychologists would, you know, who are not medical doctors, uh, would be should be able to do something like this, but to have a, a broader array of qualified people to be able to make these um, determinations, like physicians in a city hospital or in any hospital, like someone on every shift, you know, being able to be to address this question so that it's not always the police having to be called and. Um, Commissioner, I appreciate that. And of course, we always want to make sure that there, particularly in situations of a behavioral health crisis, alternatives to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, every hospital looks a little bit different. Um, some hospitals have many individuals who are trained in assessing and initiating some uh, particularly smaller hospitals, less so. Um, that's something that we um, certainly want to support uh, identifying alternate ways to address that, whether it's through mm -hmm. our conference of crisis services or um, a training for individuals to be able to do that. We've done some training with hospitals, some training, uh, some hospitals do it internally, but there are, of course, opportunities for us to enhance that. As, as you all know, we are very lucky that we have a lot of hospital settings um, in San Francisco and of course opportunities and as staff change uh, to be able to support that. One of the things that we've done uh, certainly through house, the housing conservatorship process and in gathering this information is we know that there's opportunities uh, for us to update and to partner with hospitals around the LPS delegated agreements. Um, including trainings and ensuring that individuals are appropriately assessed um, and offered services uh, prior to discharge. And so that's something that we're working very closely with hospitals on and the Hospital Council of Northern California to accomplish. Thank you. And, um, and I appreciate you, you know, explaining this and entertaining the question to the level that you have, because it, it's just, it seems that it would be, uh, in, as at a policy level, the city, the department, reaching out to practitioners and, you know, saying, and as we move toward trying to keep medical decisions medicalized instead of, you know, bringing law enforcement into it in a place where they don't, they, they have no expertise, encouraging there to be, to be more uh, engagement from that profession uh, in helping us to make that happen. It's just a thought. Um, I have a question uh, about, I think it's page three of what we received, um, probably the same that you used. When you were talking about notice for in individuals with five or more 5150 holds, I just wondered what that looked like, what the contours of that. Is that kind of like a, you know, a, mostly a one-time thing, or is it that those, the people that fall into that level, they start being kind of touched more? Um, as you go forward. Um, and it certainly depends on the individual and and I'll just say this gets complicated um, because we do have multiple hospitals. So um, it's the, the fifth 5150 that we are tracking for an individual. Um, unfortunately, that could mean that it's their six or seventh 5150 because we weren't notified um, from a hospital that they were there. Um, that being that being said, it is a one page document um, that an individual receives explaining what housing conservatorship is, um, that this is their 65150 or seventh or eighth, depending on the situation in a 12 month period and what that can mean in terms of being on the pathway towards housing conservatorship. It also details um, how we can support them to engage in voluntary services. And it's, of course, part of our legal responsibility to give them this document, um, but also an opportunity for us to have a conversation with individuals about services in the community and how we can support mm -hmm. them. Um, of course, the services and that individualized treatment plan looks different for each person. Uh, so it's a different conversation with each individual. Thank you. And I had a question also uh, about, uh, you said that there was one case that was not awarded, that was presented, mm -hmm. I guess, to the court and not awarded. Can you uh, let us know uh, what the dynamics were there? Uh, because I know that um, 
this process is designed to be extremely careful about um, when somebody is uh, presented for this conservatorship. And I know that um, you and your colleagues take this extraordinarily seriously. So I just wonder what went on in that circumstance for the court not to grant it. Um, I appreciate that. I one the challenge that we've really seen um, is the through this process the burden of documentation um, from the different hospitals um, and not just for the petition um, that is of course something that we're prepared to show why an individual requires conservatorship to stabilize them and why voluntary services um, aren't appropriate or have not been successful in the past um, and that is pretty standard for compulsory care. Um, that being said, for housing conservatorship, for uh, each 5150 of the eight, we have to sh have documentation for that 5150 that they've been offered voluntary services. Starting at the fifth 5150, it's even a higher level um, of documentation burden, including the notice um, and the note detailing that the notice was given in the conversation that happened. Um, so there's certainly a lot of opportunity for information mm -hmm. to be missed in that, um, even if those conversations are happening um, and particularly hard to navigate that across multiple hospitals in San Francisco and making sure that everyone is doing the documentation appropriately. So that case was a situation where the documentation was lacking um, and we were mm -hmm. unable to move forward. Um, that's something we work very closely with the hospitals with, particularly for individuals who are on very closely on that pathway um, to be able to support that process as much as possible. Um, it, within the Department of Public Health, I have a team and particularly our program director for assisted outpatient treatment, Dr. Wright, who is always available and receives those calls on the weekends or middle of the night when somebody's there to make sure that she's supporting that documentation happening. Um, but it is a, a very high uh, burden for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. and I understand the difficulty that you face since it, it's a it's a problem so uh, thanks for the presentation it's uh, great work uh, commissioner Sean have been set so far, um, you know, having seen the systems, you know, like since, you know, the, the late 90s to how it had, you know, like um, transformed to what it is today. I think that there are a couple of things that um, that seems that we are still trying to work through is, you know, like getting people from, you know, um, accessing emergency services to more stabilized, you know, had, um, care and housing. And so this doesn't seem to be too far off that same track also, but because, you know, like you are also talking about. So, this is just just kind of hypothetical here, and I'm pretty sure that you are experiencing a lot of like oppositions, you know, like, you know, under the, the name of like, um, civil liberty, for instance, you know, and, um, and so. So, in addition to that, of course, you know, like the. The police continue to be involved in the 5150 process. Um, and have we been able to track, you know, like how much training, you know, the officers who are initiating these 51, 5150 have done, you know, like, um, you know, like, um, yeah, actually overall, you know, like, because I think that, you know, like, um, you know, for a long time, I think that was part of the struggle is because that's not really the expertise of the law enforcement officers and we are making them do something clinical, which is, you know, like to help hospitalize patients, you know, like who should be hospitalized rather than, you know, like, um, making decisions to take them to like, um, 850 Brian, for instance. So, so, so my question here is that, you know, like, what are we doing to like build trust in the community that, you know, like that they would um, be able to lean on the officers to do the right thing, which is, you know, to take them to the hospitals in the, instead of to the county jail. Yeah, and I think this is an I really appreciate the question and, of course, very complex and um, a long history, as you noted, of involuntary treatment and what that means in the community and the trust and law enforcement and people who are disproportionately impacted by policing and 
it's incredibly complex. And and just to say briefly, you know, I, I think, um, well, I'll say in terms of the training, I know that law enforcement takes that very seriously, that the police department does a robust training around that. And and still, of course, law enforcement are not clinical providers. Um, and so there there is, of course, some level of gap there. Um, we want to make sure that law enforcement have tools available to them to support individuals as first responders um, and also tools, as you noted, um, outside of traditional criminal justice. Um, and so we want to be able to support that. Um, that being said, that training is not something that the Department of Public Health or Behavioral Health Services oversees because their authority is granted separately in the Welfare and Institutions Code. So that's not something that we oversee and we partner very closely with them to support their efforts. Um, that being said, I think part of the work, of course, is how we as a system um, and so much of this has been done just in the last couple of years, um, but look to alternatives to law enforcement um, and alternatives to support individuals in times of crisis. Um, so it's not it's not always a law enforcement response. I think the street crisis response team has been a really important tool and step in that. And we all know, of course, that there's a lot more that is being done and can be done uh, to support individuals. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we have the right resources matched to individuals, particularly in this in these critical moments of crisis. Um, and it is really an opportunity for us as a system um, and we should be supporting individuals. And um, part of our work is our continuum of care and making sure that we have services and low threshold services and services that are, uh, you know, we talk a lot about um, in our system and the work that I do about a whatever it takes and wherever it takes approach so that we can proactively and hopefully mitigate the risk of an individual reaching a point of crisis to begin with. And so the work is really on both sides, um, which of course is complex. In terms of building trust in the community, that certainly takes time um, and and understandably there is a lot of fair mistrust um, of the system and not just with law enforcement but even the health system we know um, and so uh, you know again such programs like the street crisis response team not only does a lot of work to respond uh, to those calls but also to be in the community and to participate in community events and to build that trust um, there's a lot that we've done around you know educational campaigns and um, public service announcements that are available, but we know at the end of the day, it's being present um, and building those relationships with community members and community leaders. Um, and that takes a little bit of time. We've seen a huge um, increase in that, even in the short year that we've implemented. And of course, there's a long way to go. It, it took us so long to get to this point of mistrust, um, and it's gonna take a, a lot of time and a lot of investment, um, certainly from all of us as service providers, um, and as community responders to be able to move away from that. Th thank you so much. You know, I just want to, um, you know, share my appreciations, you know, for this kind of like in innovative strategies, you know, and, and really, you know, trying to also, you know, like not only to like, help preserve you know like um patients housing but also at the same time you know like have a pathway for them to like work toward recovery um so i really appreciate that and i think that with the bureaucracy you know of the whole systems and that you have moved so much is not an easy task and you know and i wish you you know all the success and you know and i can't wait to hear more you know like um as you continue to wrote this out thank you commissioner Commissioner Christian, did you have another question or was that the hand from before? I'm sorry, I didn't. That was a new hand. Thank you for catching that. Um, Dr. Almeida, I, I remember that I also wanted to ask you whether you thought um, that the well being checks might go down that are being done by the police department, uh, the checks that, they're, that they do might go down uh, in the future, given that the city is rolling out these different teams uh, or maybe contemplating. Uh, a new team that might be uh, community based, truly community based, you know, neighborhood to some extent, maybe even that might be able to go uh, door to door when this is necessary to just check it out in the first place and, you know, maybe um, hand it off to somebody who had the expertise to deal with what was going on. Or, you know, that could also be 
I'm sure it has its um, problems and dangers associated with it as well. Just curious about your thoughts about that. Absolutely. I mean, my short answer is yes. Um, and of course, you know, as I noted, there's a lot of complexities, uh, more so than other call code types uh, with the well being checks and just in the variety of the types of calls. And so I certainly think having community based response um, and other teams that are deploying to these types of calls will certainly help that. And then I think the work and what you highlighted is really how we make sure that it's a really tight knit um, network and web. Uh, so if there is a presenting primary mental health need or behavioral health need, which we know comes up in a certain percentage of these well being check calls um, that we're um, employing or another part of our system, particularly the street crisis response team who would have that expertise to come to the scene to support that. There's a lot of conversations and work being done around that now, you know, as we shift away from this traditional law enforcement response and having these other teams, there's a lot of opportunity to have a different response and also a, a lot of opportunity to ensure that our responses are well coordinated um, and that there is clear and easy handoff. Um, and I'll just say, not just for those teams, we also work, as I mentioned, very closely um, with the police department. So the police department will also transfer calls over to the street crisis response team. It is a, if it's a primary behavioral health need that comes up. And so we expect across the board that there will be some shifting in this, and that'll be something that we need to closely monitor over the next couple of years uh, to see what are barriers um, for shifts that don't happen and where are opportunities to enhance our services to make sure that there's more capacity. Thank you. I believe that's it, Dr. Almeida. Thank you so much for your presentation and all the questions. Thank you so much. Always fascinating. Um, yeah, always uh, great to see you. Commissioners, item five is um, emerging issues. Anything? Not here. Uh, person on the line, if you'd like to make a comment on item five, emerging issues, please press star three to raise your hand. Star three. I don't see a hand, so we can move on to public comment. Uh, person on the line, this is your opportunity to make a comment on a topic that is not on the agenda. So please press star three if you'd like to make a comment um, at this time. I also do not see a hand for that item. So commissioners, you, you are now at uh, consideration for adjournment. I so move that we adjourn our committee meeting. And I second. I will do a roll call vote. Commissioner Gerardo? Yes. Commissioner Chung? Yes. Commissioner Christian? I need to hear, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I need to hear you say that. Uh, right. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Well, how yes. about the cat though? Does the cat have a vote today? Uh, and uh, then that, that, is, that is his vote. <laughs> and Commissioner Bernal? Guest vote of yes. All right. Thank you all very much for um, attending, and, um, and I will see most of you in a few minutes at the full commission meeting. Thanks all. Thanks, Thanks. Chair Dorado. Bye-bye. Thank you.